day with so much ceremony begins with birds, with bells, with whistles from a factory. Such white gold skies our eyes first open on, such brilliant walls, that for a moment we wonder, where is the music coming from, the energy? The day we You're listening to the voice of Elizabeth Bishop, Bishop reading from her book, North and South, a page from this afternoon's edition of Anthology. Fleetwood. Every Sunday at 3, WNBC, in conjunction with the Poetry Center of the YW and YMHA, 92nd Street and Lexington Avenue, brings you Anthology, a selection of readings from poets, past and present, and the music to accompany their poetry. Our guests today, Mr. Tom Weatherly, and by transcription, Elizabeth Bishop. been a week of homecoming for your anthology annotator. Homecoming from an extended hiatus on Music Through the Night, and homecoming from a brief week's hiatus for our Sunday program of poetry. Thank you so much for all your kind letters in respect to both programs. One I particularly enjoyed was addressed to anthology from a listener in Philadelphia. She wrote to say she had enjoyed WNBC's colorful European travelogue, which ended last Sunday evening. Her poetic P.S. was of a more personal nature. We have a poem we enjoy, although as readers we are lacking. The lines that scan the metered phrases always take us sad shellacking. So, since we cannot read this verse and no one else we know could, we now have turned to you for help, quite confident that Fleetwood... Well, it's a long way between would and could, not to mention should... But since the poem in question is a great favorite of mine, and since it also deals with a homecoming, perhaps this will be a pleasant task for all concerned. This is My Lost Youth by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The music is from Jerome Kern's Mark Twain Suite. Often I think of the beautiful town that is seated by the sea. Often in thought go up and down the pleasant streets of that dear old town, and my youth comes back to me, and a verse of a Lapland song is haunting my memory still. A boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. I can see the shadowy lines of its trees, and catch in sudden gleams the sheens of the far surrounding seas, and islands that were the Hesperides of all my boyish dreams. And the burden of that old song, it murmurs and whispers still. A boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. I remember the black wharves and the slips and the sea tides tossing free, and Spanish sailors with bearded lips, and the beauty and mystery of the ships and the magic of the sea. And the voice of the wayward song is singing and saying still, A boy's will is the wind's will, And the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. I remember the bulwarks by the shore, And the fort upon the hill, The sunrise gun with its hollow roar, The drumbeat repeating o'er and o'er, And the bugle wild and shrill. And the music of that old song throbs in my memory still, a boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. I remember the sea fight far away, how it thundered o'er the tide, and the dead captains, as they lay in their graves overlooking the tranquil bay, 
where they in battle died. And the sound of that mournful song goes through me with a thrill. A boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. I can see the breezy dome of groves, the shadows of Deering's woods, and the friendships old, and early loves come back with a Sabbath sound as of doves in quiet neighborhoods. And the verse of that sweet old song, it flutters and murmurs still. A boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. I remember the gleams and glooms that dart across the schoolboy's brain, the song and the silence in the heart that in part are prophecies and in part are longings wild and vain. And the voice of that fitful song sings on and is never still. A boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. There are things of which I may not speak. There are dreams that cannot die. There are thoughts that make the strong heart weak and bring a pallor into the cheek and a mist before the eye. And the words of that fatal song come over me like a chill. A boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. Strange to me now are the forms I meet when I visit that dear old town. The native air is pure and sweet. And the trees that o'ershadow each well-known street as they balance up and down are singing the beautiful song, are sighing and whispering still. A boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. And Deering's woods are fresh and fair, and with joy that is almost pain, my heart goes back to wander there, and among the dreams of that days that were... I find my lost youth again in the strange and beautiful song. The groves are repeating it still. A boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. Down East Flavor to a poet born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1911. Her first book of poetry appeared in the anthology Trial Balances, and subsequently in such publications as New Directions, Partisan Review, and The New Yorker. North and South, published in 1946 as the result of a Houghton Mifflin Fellowship, placed her at once in the forefront of younger American poets. This afternoon, we're to hear Elizabeth Bishop read three selections from North and South. We'll hear Anaphora, Late Air, and The Fish. Each day with so much ceremony begins with birds, with bells, with whistles from a factory. Such white gold skies our eyes first open on, such brilliant walls, that for a moment we wonder, where is the music coming from, the energy? The day was meant for what ineffable creature we must have missed. Oh, promptly he appears and takes his earthly nature instantly, instantly falls, victim of long intrigue, assuming memory and mortal, mortal fatigue. More slowly falling into sight and showering into stippled faces, darkening, condensing all his light. In spite of all the dreaming squandered upon him with that look, suffers our uses and abuses, sinks through the drift of bodies, sinks through the drift of classes, to evening, to the beggar in the park, who, weary without lamp or book, prepares stupendous studies, the fiery event of every day in endless, endless ascent. From a magician's midnight sleeve, the radio singers distribute all their love songs over the dew-wet lawns, and like a fortune teller's, their marrow piercing guesses, or whatever you believe. But on the Navy Yard aerial, I find better witnesses for love on summer nights. Five remote red lights keep their nests there, phoenixes burning quietly where the dew cannot climb. 
I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat half out of water with my hook fast in the corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable and homely. Here and there, his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper, and its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper. Shapes like full-blown roses, stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lawn, and infested with tiny white sea lice, and underneath two or three rags of green weed hung down. While his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly, I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder like a big peony. I looked into his eyes, which were far larger than mine, but shallower and yellowed, the irises backed and packed with tarnished tin foil, seen through lenses of old scratched isinglass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare. It was more like the tipping of an object toward the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw, and then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like, hung five old pieces of fish line, or four, and a wire leader with the swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. A green line frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines, and a fine black thread still crimped from the strain and snap when it broke and he got away. Like metals with their ribbons frayed and wavering, the five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. I stared and stared, and victory filled up the little rented boat from the pool of bills where oil had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine to the baler rusted orange, the sun-cracked thwarts, the orlocks on their strings, the gunnels, until everything was rainbow, 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 and I let the fish go. Elizabeth Bishop, reading from her book, North and South, she is perhaps the only poet alive or dead for whom I could honestly say a kind word. This is not because, as may be suspected, he is my friend, but because I was born with an inbuilt aversion to anything that is long hair. Weatherly has no hair at all, and therefore is my kind of poet. The men who mold the poems and plays, the paintings and pastorals of human art, are almost always totally bald. Show me a man who needs a haircut, and I'll prove him a hack, Professor Albert Einstein and Beethoven notwithstanding. Show me a man who can comb his hair with a damp cloth, and I'll show you an artist. Tom, a point of order. It seems to me Mr. Bolton is making quite a sweeping statement. 